Hi friends, I am so excited to tell you about my new book, Bible Stories for Grownups, Reading Scripture with New Eyes. I'm Josh Scott, I'm the lead pastor at Grace Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And I wrote this book because I love the Bible. And what I began to realize over time is that as I grew and changed and learned, that my understanding of some of these wonderful stories in the Bible didn't grow with me. And in this study, I hope to offer some behind the scenes information, stuff you may not have come across in your normal reading of the Bible. We'll dig into familiar interpretations and then we'll ask, what might it look like to read this story through a grown up lens? My hope is this book will help deepen your love and appreciation of the Bible. But not only that, that would help you maybe have a different understanding for the world around you, for who you are and for what it means to partner with God in this world to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So this is week two of our series, and Josh Scott, you know, was in the video just there. He was our guest back in May and he's kind of a friend of the church. And the idea behind his book is that so often we're introduced to these Bible stories in Sunday school or growing up, and we get obviously the most simplified surface-level reading of them, which is appropriate for when we're young, but it's important that that's not our understanding forever. It's important to go back and reread these stories through a grown-up lens and see what fresh insights we can get from them. So last week, Ryan talked about the story of Noah and the ark and what it might have to say about the violence and chaos in our own world. The second story that Josh Scott looks at in his book is what's called the binding of Isaac. And if you're not familiar with it, this is the story of Abraham, the father of the Israelite nation, being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. So we'll read the text of that story in just a moment, and then we'll spend the rest of the sermon digging into it and what different spiritual leaders throughout the years have made of that story. But I want to start today in the same place that Josh Scott starts in his chapter about this, which is becoming a dad. He... He kicks off this chapter kind of talking about the way that changed his insight into God's character. And as I was reading that, I was thinking about the first time I ever stood up here at the well like this, like not holding a guitar in front of me, was during a sermon that Ryan gave back in 2019. And that sermon was about Christian exclusivism and things like that. But I got to give an interview in the middle of it. And the thing I most remember talking about back then was my son. He was only a few years old at the time. And I remember marveling at how much being a dad had recontextualized God for me. God is so frequently referred to as a parent in the Bible. It's one of the most common metaphors that the biblical authors use for God, which is beautiful. But once you're a parent yourself, it can kind of make you wonder about some of the things that God is depicted doing or asking for. And the question I, that I've been asking myself since becoming a dad is, is God a worse dad than I am? So at the beginning of chapter two in his book, Josh Scott writes something fairly similar. He says, something else happened in that hospital room though. The experience of this little bundle of human joy completely transformed the lens through which I saw my faith and read the Bible. The story of Abraham and Isaac is not easy for any human being to read, I hope, but it hits especially hard for parents. And that question that I asked, is God a worse parent than we are, is, is one that I keep coming back to when I'm thinking about this story. So the story we're talking about is found in Genesis 22, but to set the stage first, a man named Abraham was called by God for reasons we aren't really given to leave his home country and come to a new place, quote, the place that God will show him. So we see his initial call to follow God back in Genesis 12. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, that's his name at this point in the story, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God calls this man to, to leave the place he's known, to go to a new unknown place, 
And God also promises him a son, even though Abraham and his wife Sarah are both too old for that to seem possible. In fact, God promises him that his descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky. He'll be, he'll be a father many times over. He'll be the father of a nation, of multiple nations. And many adventures later, against all odds, that promised son is born. The son Abraham and Isaac never thought they would see. They name him Isaac. And then a few years later, this happens. This is a bit of a long scripture reading, but it's hard to condense this story and have it make any sense, so bear with me. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac. This is where the title of of the story comes from and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So to paraphrase a common internet expression, what the heck did I just read? (laughs) For over a thousand years, people have heard this story and been alarmed by it. I'd be worried about anybody that was not alarmed by it. It's really upsetting. I don't want, if you're, a, if you're a long-time Bible reader, if you're deeply versed in these stories, I don't want our familiarity with this story to pave over how horrifying it is. <laughs> I think sometimes we hear these Bible stories, especially these really old ones from the beginning of Genesis and stuff, and in our heads we picture almost like cardboard cutouts with beards kind of moving around in front of a two-dimensional background, like it's like a flannel graph or a cartoon or something. But try to imagine a real man and his real son going through this experience. If I try to imagine myself in this story and I imagine my son asking me the questions that Isaac is asking Abraham, it, it honestly makes me sick to my stomach. It's a little, a little much for empathy to handle. There are, there are so many disturbing moments here in the way that this is written. There's... There's a twisted echo of God's initial promise. When, when God first called Abraham, he told him to leave his home and go to the place that I will show you. And here he's told, again, like, leave your home and go to the mountain I will show you, which is a kind of a dark repetition of that initial promise. And then there's this slow escalation at the beginning where the way God asks, he says, take your son your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And it gets, it's calculated to get like more emotional each time. And also just the way this is written is so eerie to me with these, these cold clinical details of Abraham getting this order and just setting off to do it. It's like he's in a trance or something. We don't see Abraham argue or weep or yell or anything. It's, it's a very odd story. So what are we supposed to make of it? Josh Scott asks it like this in his book. He says, what does this story mean? 
the meaning most readily available, which I remember being taught at a young age, is that we should all be like Abraham, willing to sacrifice whatever God calls us to in order to be faithful. If we do whatever God asks of us, then God will bless us richly as a result. That reading, however, minimizes the trauma of the story significantly. It ignores the real human experience presented in the narrative and creates an image of God that is problematic, to say the least. Believers have been wrestling with this story for thousands of years. It's not a new modern circumstance to read this and go, yikes. It's ancient Jewish interpreters had certain takes on it. The authors of the New Testament, like especially the writer of Hebrews, has an interesting take on it. People have tried to find a way to contextualize this for millennia. And what that tells me is it's okay to be uncomfortable with this story and to want to question it. People of faith have always done that. There are a few ways to make sense of this story that I've personally found meaningful, but I'm afraid that before we get to the uplifting part, we do have to spend a minute getting even deeper into horror movie territory. So here's the least fun pop quiz I've ever done before. Raise your hand if you've read about human sacrifice in the Bible. You don't, you don't have to actually do that. When I, when I hear human sacrifice, you know, I picture someone being thrown into a volcano or I picture Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom or something. It's not necessarily something we'd associate with the Bible. And so it might be alarming to hear, but there's some discussion of this in the Old Testament. In the Covenant Code, which scholars think is one of the oldest layers of the book of Exodus, going back really far, there's a law in Exodus about offering sacrifices to God. It says, You shall not delay to make offerings from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall remain with its mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. So the part about the wheat and the wine is not startling. And if you know how sacrifices and the temple worked in ancient Judaism, then the, the part about sheep and oxen might not be unfamiliar either. But they really slid something in right in the middle there. There's a commandment about offering firstborn sons and scholars are pretty sure that originally that would have meant exactly what it sounds like. Now, <laughs> now pretty soon after that, in um, Exodus 34 and several other places, it does give us an out. There's a commandment in Exodus 34.20 that says, The firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem. What I take this text to be saying is, technically you owe the firstborn of a donkey to God, those are the rules, but since donkeys are extremely useful animals, it would be okay to substitute a lamb instead. So you meet the requirement, but you don't have to give up your donkey. And then in the same way, of course, it says when it comes to human offerings, don't actually do this. Exodus 34 is saying you need to substitute something else. A sheep, specifically, which makes it an interesting detail that the offering Abraham ends up making is a, a sheep as well. So it seems like there are very ancient laws about this in the Old Testament, but it also seems like almost as soon as those laws existed, they got reinterpreted or renegotiated or an out was built in. There's no physical evidence that the ancient Israelites actually did any human sacrifices. Archaeologists have never found anything like that. But it is something that the nations around them sometimes did. They have found evidence of it in other places. And it's something the Israelites knew about. It comes up in the Bible. If you've ever heard the name Moloch, which he's a character in Paradise Lost. I think of the show Sleepy Hollow. It's like the main devil that they're fighting or whatever. It comes from these narratives. It's... It's a word that we find in the Bible when the Bible's discussing human sacrifice. And historically, it's usually been interpreted as the name of a demon or the name of like a deity that these awful sacrifices are being offered to. But modern scholars since the 30s actually think it's probably the name of a type of sacrifice being offered to God. 
So as the Bible goes on, it's made very clear that this is terrible. There's all of the later Israelite laws and all of the prophets who mention it strongly condemn this practice. Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that that updated part of Exodus, the prophet Jeremiah, all insist that this sort of thing is detestable and God wants no part of it. But this kind of sacrifice is clearly something that did exist in the ancient world. It's something the Israelites distanced themselves from. And the reason I bring all this up is not because it's October and I'm in spooky mode. It's because this is one interpretation of this story about Abraham and Isaac. Maybe it's a story about this distancing. Maybe it's a story about leaving behind a horrible ritual and leaving that mindset in the past and entering a new chapter of faith where that sort of thing will never be required. It could be what scholars call an etiology, which is a story that's told to indicate why something exists or how something came to be the way that it is. Or in this case, why something doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it's a story about leaving behind such rituals once and for all. Okay, so all of that is disturbing, and I swear I'm done talking about devils and stuff, but the point is, this is part of the background of the ancient Near East. There's evidence other cultures were doing this, and there's evidence that in various places in the Bible, the ancient Israelites had to be repeatedly told, don't do this, which, if you, if you know anything about how big signs get put up in public, if you see a sign taped up somewhere that says, like, no skiing off the roof, you know someone tried that. Like, there's, that's too specific to just be an, a vague idea. You know somebody did that once. So you don't normally have to give strong warnings about things no one was doing. So when we see repeated prohibitions of this kind of ritual in the Bible, when the prophets are saying, do not do this, you know if they had to be told not to do it, someone was thinking of doing it, which brings us back to Abraham. Josh Scott writes, Remember when the voice of God called Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, he didn't flinch. He didn't argue, debate, or negotiate. It's almost like the command made sense to him. Is it possible that both father and son take for granted that this is just how it all works? This is just what happens. Sometimes the gods demand from us the most important thing or person to us. This story seems frightful to us, horrifying, but there must have been something about this command that didn't shock Abraham. Why not? What was his background that he could hear a request like this and not be appalled? So when we first meet Abraham in the Bible, he's living in a city called Ur of the Chaldeans, Scholars are pretty certain that this is the area that would later become Babylon, and now it's somewhere in Iraq. This area would have had a polytheistic religion, and like basically every nation in that era had a polytheistic religion. And there's actually a verse in the book of Joshua that comes right out and says that Abraham and his family grew up worshiping, quote, other gods. So those couple of facts are all we know about Abraham's life before God calls him. But anytime, anytime a crucially important figure in the Bible gets zero backstory, later interpreters and writers have tended to kind of fill in the blanks. You get all these stories and legends shared around because they were wondering, you know, what was Abraham's early life like? Why did God choose him? We're not told. And there came to be some very entertaining legends about Abraham and how a young man growing up in Chaldea might have come to realize that there was only one true God. My favorite of these stories is from an ancient book called The Apocalypse of Abraham. There's this story where Abraham is helping his father out in the local temple, and there's these idols all in the temple. And one of the idols falls over by accident, and it breaks. And so the two of them are trying to carry it out so they can repair it. And the head comes off in Abraham's hands, and he's just holding this head. And so he's helping his dad carve a new body for the idol so they can glue its head back on. And suddenly he has this realization, wait, these things aren't gods at all. Like, if anything, we're the ones taking care of them. To be clear, this is a later Jewish legend. This isn't a book that ever made it into the Bible. But it shows that ancient people were thinking about these things. 
And because of stories like this one, and then there's lots of others, Abraham came to have the reputation of being the first monotheist. He's, he's sometimes thought of as like the first person in history to discover that there is one God of the universe and to follow that God. There's, there's more legends about this from the historian Josephus and the Book of Jubilees and different rabbinic commentaries. But the point is this. Abraham wasn't magically born with correct opinions and beliefs about God. None of us are magically born with correct ideas about God. Part of the journey of faith is being open and listening for God's voice to call us into something new. Abraham grew up in a culture like all of us do. He grew up with the ideas that that culture handed to him about how faith worked and what customs and rituals a person needed to adhere to. When God called him to leave that place, he followed. But don't you think some of that old baggage was rattling around in his head somewhere? So, back to Genesis 22. There's a critical detail in this story that the first time someone pointed this out to me blew my mind. It has to do with the names of God. Last week, Ryan talked about the documentary hypothesis, which I did not realize he was going to do, and I thought I was going to have to explain all of that, so as soon as I saw him go into it, I was like, yes. Um, So that takes a lot of pressure off of me to explain it, but if you missed last week's sermon, basically... Different authors in the Bible use different names for God, and that's one of the main ways we can pick apart who might have written different stories is which name they use for God. The two main ones are some authors refer to God as Elohim, which is basically the generic name for a God or the gods in the ancient world. It's the same way that our English word God You know, we use capital letters to kind of differentiate this, but our English word God could mean God, capital G, or it could mean like Zeus or Thor or the Egyptian gods. That's just the English word for a deity. So you have to look at context to know which one you're talking about. So, of course, when Elohim gets translated into English Bibles, it's translated as God, which makes sense. But then there's also God's personal name, which is spelled with four Hebrew letters, uh, yod He wa He. And this is the the personal name of the God of the Bible. It only means that God. And scholars are pretty certain it's pronounced Yahweh, but in many traditions it's considered too holy to pronounce at all. So it became common practice to substitute Lord or Adonai there, which is why now in English that gets translated Lord or the Lord in um, small caps usually. So that's all interesting, but why do I bring it up again? The critical detail that various scholars have pointed out is that the name of God changes right at the climax of this story. So here's just the very end of Genesis 22 again. When they came to the place that God, Elohim, had shown him, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. When Abraham is first chosen, when he's first called to be the father of a nation, that's Yahweh who calls him. It's the Lord. It's Elohim that asks Abraham to make this sacrifice of his son. That could be read God or the gods or a God. It's it's also a plural in Hebrew, so it could be the gods, but it's a different word. And then here at the moment that Abraham has the knife raised, an angel of the Lord stops him and says not to do it. It's a different name for God. What does this mean? The first time I ever saw this pointed out, it was in a book by Doug Paget called Flipped. And Paget interprets it this way. Maybe God never asked for this sacrifice. Maybe Abraham only thought he did. If we translate Elohim here as the gods or something like that, then the story totally changes. Maybe this whole episode was Abraham slipping back into the faith he was raised in, an older and harsher narrative. And even if Elohim is a reference to the Israelite God, which it often is, 
there's still something going on here. Someone shaped the ending of this story or added a different ending later or pasted two versions together. Something's going on here. So Paget writes that in the parts of the story where Elohim asks for this sacrifice, he says, we hear the gods of Abraham's childhood calling to him to return to the sacrificial story of his youth. The religions we were raised in can have echoes that continue in our lives long after we've had a faith shift. I've met so many progressive Christians who've you know, deconstructed the rigid systems they grew up in and they've found a more life-giving version of faith. And then out of nowhere, sometimes years later, they'll have these intrusive thoughts that are like, what if the old system was right after all? What if I'm, what if I'm off the path? It can take a lot of healing and counseling and work to get past those old ideas sometimes. So that's another, that's a second way to read this story. Maybe the different name for God is a clue. Maybe this command is coming from a different deity, or since I I assume none of us in this room necessarily believes in like other deities per se, maybe Abraham only thinks he hears this command. Maybe it's coming from an idea, an old idea of God that he has. In in Rachel Held Evans' book, Inspired, she, um, she talks about this story, and she, she rattles off a bunch of different ways of interpreting it, including both of the ones I've talked about so far. She writes, Was God using Abraham to make a point against the practice of child sacrifice common among the pagans, or did Abraham only imagine he heard the voice of God? To bring it back to Josh Scott's book that we're covering in this series, He says it a little differently, but I think he's kind of riffing on the same idea. He writes, I have come to see in this story of the near sacrifice of Isaac an invitation to Abraham and to us to open ourselves to changing our minds about God. I'm not suggesting that God changes with the times and we need to change with God. I'm saying that our understanding of God is significantly shaped by our context where we live, what our family of origin is like, what we were taught about faith, and so much more. And we are often totally unaware of it. Sometimes we're carrying around an old story, an unhealthy story, and we need to be willing to examine the stories that we live by and see where they might be harmful. If we don't examine these old narratives critically, we can end up making the lives of the people around us significantly worse, or even putting them in danger. And that's, that's the point I want to park on here at the end for a bit. The way we read these stories, the way we imagine God, has real tangible effects on the people around us, on the world around us. I grew up reading this story the way that many people have grown up reading this story, which is Abraham was a hero for doing this. His willingness to sacrifice Isaac means he's rock solid in his obedience to God. We should all aspire to be that faithful. It took me a while. It maybe took me becoming a parent to start asking, what kind of God would that be, though, that would ask us to do this? Like I said at the beginning, is God a worse parent than we are? I wouldn't ask someone to do this. (laughs) There's a There's a quote from that book, Flipped, that I mentioned earlier, where Paget writes, how we understand God's relationship to death and sacrifice has great influence over the way we live. If God is justified in demanding sacrifice, then we can justify sacrifice, even to the point of committing violence as a situational necessity. When God's justice or holiness is appeased by sacrifice, it makes transactional systems of faith not just an option, but a requirement. And I think that's the real problem with this outlook, is that if we're sure enough that we're following God, we can start to see sacrificing other people as okay. The, the main character of this story is supposedly Abraham, and we're kind of looking at it through his eyes. We're talking about what he's willing to give up, but Josh Scott points out Abraham's obedience will cost him greatly, but it will cost Isaac more. Now, I want to acknowledge here, it's true that following Jesus sometimes requires sacrifice. That's true. That's true. 
It's never fun to think about having to sacrifice things that matter to us, but if we're trying to be followers of Jesus, there's a, there is a certain amount of that that's built into the whole path. Jesus sometimes gives difficult commandments. He, one person is thinking of following him, and he tells that guy to sell all that he has and give the money to the poor. He tells his disciples they need to take up their crosses and follow him. He, Jesus lays down his own life and prays for those who are taking it from him. But Jesus is laying down his own life, not someone else's, and I think that makes all the difference. Sometimes our faith might require sacrifice from us. It it really might, but if it's a faith worth having, that sacrifice will be things like laying down our own ego, setting aside our own selfishness to help someone else. If our faith causes us to lay down ourselves or the things we care about for the benefit of other people, that faith is making us better. If it tells us that sometimes someone else needs to go so that we can be blessed, it's making us worse. To give one example of this mindset, and I can think of several, but just one example It's pretty well established in the data that rates of homelessness are much higher for LGBTQ youth. There's there's undoubtedly a lot of reasons for this, but certainly one of them is the likelihood of young LGBTQ people being kicked out of their homes due to religion or intolerant beliefs. They can come out and lose their support system and have nowhere to go. This quote is from a much, much longer analysis of the data by the Trevor Project, but I just wrote down this part. Family conflict about youth's LGBTQ identities was a factor in this housing instability, with 40% of youth who said they had been kicked out and 55% of youth who said they had run away or been abandoned, reporting that it had been due to mistreatment or fear of mistreatment related to their LGBTQ identity. So we're talking about Abraham and Isaac today. What percentage of these parents, the ones who ejected their child from their home when they came out, what percentage of them believed they were following God's will? Did they hear a voice from the faith they were raised in, the rigid faith of their past that told them, this is a test for you to see whether you love God enough? I I know I'm hypothesizing about other people's motives here, which is dangerous and probably unfair, but... Do you think some of the parents in this study saw themselves as being asked to choose between following God, their idea of God anyway, and loving their child? The stories that we believe matter. It's it's not about thoughts in our brains. Like it's it's not about like how do you interpret a Genesis twenty two from an ancient text. The religious stories that we believe shape how we react to real things that actually happen in our lives. If you've grown up with this understanding of the Isaac story, where Abraham's a hero for making this choice, and this was the good choice that he was to have made, and we should all aspire to have this much faith, and then you find yourself in a situation where you think you're having to choose between your actual child and God, that story could warp how you respond to that. If that's the narrative that lives in your head, how do you respond when you're having to choose between your flesh and blood child and your idea of God? The way we think about these stories matters so much. I don't believe that God puts us in situations where the faithful thing to do is to hurt other people, put them in danger, sacrifice them. I think that's a bad and a dangerous view of God. And I don't... If you know me at all, I don't take a lot of strong stances. I'm an Enneagram 9. I I, I like to see, I see where other people are coming from. I like to try and meet them in the middle. That is a stance I will take. I don't think that's a good view of God. There's a quote from Barbara Brown Taylor that it's gotten super famous. You might have seen it before. I see it pop up on the internet all the time. But it's from her book, Holy Envy. And she writes, the only clear line I draw these days is this. When my religion tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. I love that quote, and I think it gets at something important. 
the way that we love God is through other people. If we ever find ourselves having this idea that what God wants from us is to harm someone else, we've got it backwards. In the New Testament, in the book of 1 John, we're told, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Those who say I love God and hate a brother or sister are liars. It's strong language, but I didn't write this. The author of First John did. For those who do not have a brother, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from Him is this: Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. What I take First John to be saying is, we love God best when we love others. If we think we hear God's voice telling us to do anything, it should be this, love. If we think we hear God's voice telling us to do something different from that, I would submit that's not God's voice that we're hearing. So near the end of this chapter, Josh Scott writes, The lesson Abraham learns in this story is that this God doesn't demand anything from him, but instead provides for him. Could this story be symbolic of the journey many of us have been on, a leaving behind of understandings of God that have proven too small, and an embracing of a vision of God that is more expansive, compassionate, and inclusive than we thought possible? So as we end here, I, I'm very conscious that I've shown some ancient and unsettling passages from the Hebrew Bible, and then I pivoted to the example of Jesus in the book of First John, I want to be so clear that this is not at all about pitting the Old Testament against the New Testament. That's not what I want to do here. It's about a false idea of God versus the true God. And I want to, to that end, I want to end with a quote from the prophet Micah in ancient Israel talking about exactly this stuff. I almost guarantee you've heard verse 8 of this passage before. It's one of the most famous quotes in the entire Bible, but... Because of the story we read today, I'm going to start like right before that. So Micah says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And then it doesn't say this, but between verse 7 and verse 8, I just hear no. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? That's what God wants from us, the real God, not the old problematic version we might be carrying around. The God we follow does not want us to harm others or sacrifice others or pour out expensive offerings. The God that I believe really exists, the God we see in Jesus, wants three things, justice, kindness, humility. Our faith should be making the lives of our families better, not worse. Our faith should be making us kinder, not harsher. Our faith should be making us humble, not arrogant. Like Abraham discovered, the God we follow is a God who provides for us, who cares for us. May we open our minds and our eyes to see a bigger version of God, a more expansive faith that we can step into. When Abraham is called way back at the beginning of his story, way before any of this happened, God tells him that he's calling him to make him a blessing to the nations, not to himself, to everyone. It's The blessings are not for Abraham. They're for him to pass on and make other people's lives better. May we embrace the kind of faith that doesn't just make our lives better, but that improves the lives of those around us. The kind of faith that, like this promise to Abraham, makes us a blessing to others. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for bringing us together here today to learn about some creepy stories and to learn about the kind of God that you actually are.
we, we sing as we started this morning, we sing about blood and temples and sacrifice and holy war and vengeance and and how none of those are what you want from us. We we sing about a God who who requires none of that from us, who's so much bigger than we can lock down in our ideas. Thank you for being bigger than our ideas. It's it's such a more inclusive and expansive world that you call us to create. You're, I don't believe that you are behind us calling us backwards to some old idea of you. I think you're always out in front of us calling us forward. I think you're, I think you're even better than we can conceive of, and I think you're trying to help us become more like you. Thank you for that, God, for hauling humanity forward, sometimes against our will, and teaching us what it is you actually want from us. Justice, equality, kindness, mercy, and, and the humility to know that we don't have all the answers, but we follow a God who does. Thank you for this morning and for this community. And please be with us as we leave here this week. Whatever it is that we're going through, and I know for some of us it's a lot. I know we have, we have family emergencies in our congregation. We have loss in our congregation. Be with, be with all those who are hurting. Be with those who mourn. Like Jesus says, that they will be comforted. Be with us as we leave here this week and help us to feel that love, to know the love that you that you have for us and that you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.